Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is um, 1.30 Central Time, so I'm assuming people are going to start um, joining a, web a webinar or have started already, or have joined already. Um, my name is Dr. Kit Young Hoon. I'm the Medical Officer of Health of Northwestern Health Unit. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to our meeting on climate change. Um, I think we have a great panel of speakers today, and they would provide information um, related to climate change and doing a, a vulnerability and adaptation assessment, which is our key focus um, for Northwestern Health Unit and for all public health units, climate change and the health impacts of climate change and preparing for them is part of our mandate under the Ontario Public Health Standards. And so this is um, important work for us. I think um, this is also a good regional opportunity because there, there are going to be um, many things to discuss across the region and it is a good time for us to come together and to talk about what climate change could mean for our population and what we could do about it or how we could possibly mitigate the risks of climate change. So I'd like to introduce our speakers. We have Peter Berry, who is the Senior Policy Analyst and Science Advisor uh, for Climate Change and Innovations Bureau under the Safe Environments Directorate of Health Canada. We also have Dan Brown, who's the Senior Program Officer under Climate Change and Health Adaptation Program of Health Canada. And our facilitator, Aaron Schilberg, who's a Public Health Officer working at Northwestern Health Unit. So for Northwestern Health Unit, we also have our healthy meeting policy. And so for those in the room and also those online, please make sure and take an opportunity to stretch. Um, this is going to be approximately two hours, and so we encourage people, if a, if a meeting goes beyond one hour, to take that time to stretch, move around, and um, not sit, sit down for too long of a period. And if you're eating, to eat healthy food. Um, so I'd like to welcome Erin to continue the session. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Okay. So. All right, so thank you very much for the intro. And um, so as for our agenda, which you can hopefully see here, I'm just going to give a really brief background, and then we'll have the two presentations from our two guests. And then that will be followed by a bit of a discussion where you can ask questions, provide input, and give ideas. And the presenter will be around after the session if you have any additional questions or thoughts. Uh, so those of you who are online, you are currently muted, so you will not be able to speak. But we would invite you to ask questions, type comments, or anything into the questions box of the webinar. And one of my colleagues who's here in the room will bring them forward for you. So please feel free to do that at any time, and particularly during our discussion. And as Kit said, um, take some time to stand up and walk around um, if you need to. So we, we all know that our climate is changing, and we've been hearing a lot about that in the news lately. And as a health unit here, we want
Okay. Okay. Can can people on the line hear us? If you can, maybe type yes or something. Again, yes. Okay. okay. So I'm going to backtrack a bit because I'm not sure where where I was and how long I was talking and nobody was listening except for these lovely people in the room. <laughs> um, so we'll just go back uh, to the kind of background. So we were I was discussing a bit how here at the health unit we we know that our climate's changing here in Northwestern Ontario and we want to know how these changes impact health, particularly of our population here in Northwestern Ontario. And we want to use this information to then identify policies and programs to increase resilience to these risks and then hopefully leading to a healthier population. Um, so then how will we do this? So we're going to do a climate change and health vulnerability and adaptation assessment. So what, we'll, what we're going to do technically is that we're going to look into what are the current and projected risks of climate change for Northwestern Ontario and then figure out what kind of things can we do um, in terms of health policy or programs um, to increase the resilience to these risks. So this will come in the form of a report. Um, all right, so the, this process is really a multi-step um, iterative process. So we will begin by framing and then scoping the assessment, So, which is really where we are now and what brings us here today to this meeting is to start to talk about what will we look at, what will the scope be, what, what things will we include. And then we'll do some internal work here to move things forward, like describing these risks uh, that we discussed, thinking about what future risks would be, and then we'll probably, we will redistribute some draft pieces to external stakeholders for review and additional input, and then from there we can finalize, and then once we have our assessment complete, we can identify and implement options with partners as appropriate or indicated. And then we will, of course, share our learnings with others. So if they want to do similar process, then they can. And then this will become an iterative process where we can reevaluate again as, as we need to. So as I said, we are currently at the beginning steps of this process. And this is a new process to the Northwestern Health Unit. We haven't done this before. So we've brought in some experts from the field to help us out with this. And as Kit introduced, this will be uh, Peter and Dan. Uh, so we are going to start with Peter Berry. Um, and he's going to talk us through some of the current research on health risks related to climate change and also how health authorities are completing assessments to inform measures to adapt to these risks. And then after that, we'll have Daniel Brown, and he's going to talk about uh, climate change and health adaptation in Indigenous communities. So on that note, I would like to welcome uh, Peter Berry to come and speak. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much, Erin, uh, and thanks uh, kindly to Dr. Young Hoon uh, for the invitation to participate in this uh, meeting. Um, uh, it's uh, really great to uh, participate in the full project, um, and uh, I just want to send um, uh, regards on behalf of my director, Carolyn Tatishi, of the Climate Change and Innovation uh, Bureau, because she's really excited about the uh, project. Um, in the last uh, four or five years, we've actually collaborated with uh, a number of health units, but also the Ministry of uh, Health and Long-Term Care in, uh, in Ontario uh, to conduct uh, assessments, but also to uh, develop guidance. Uh, and I'm really excited about this assessment because it's, um, it's different than the other ones that have happened uh, in Canada because of the, the wide geography that you have uh, here in the, in the diverse community. So I think a lot of health authorities uh, really across Canada uh, can actually learn uh, from from your process, so uh, it's a it's a real pleasure to uh, to be here today. So as um, Aaron mentioned, um, I uh, will talk a little bit about uh, some of the new knowledge we have on climate change uh, risk to health, including uh, some of what we know about uh, northwestern Ontario. 
Um, and then discuss the importance of actually uh, conducting assessment, uh, assessments of risks and uh, vulnerabilities, um, uh, along with some of the guidance, uh, Aaron, that uh, you mentioned that's available to public uh, health units for doing that. And then I'll uh, close by um, uh, discussing a little bit about what Health Canada is doing uh, to support partners uh, on climate change and health uh, more broadly. So in terms of uh, some of the risks, really uh, the starting point, of course, is uh, uh, you know, where we are with warming of, of the globe. Um, and uh, I suspect a number of you uh, will know, but uh, 2016 was the hottest year uh, ever recorded. Uh, but what you might not know is that broke the record of 2015, which was the hottest year ever recorded, and that broke the record of 2014, which was the hottest year ever recorded. And we've never seen three years in a row uh, break consecutive records. So this is, uh, this is concerning in terms of the rate of, uh, of warming. And importantly for Canadians and for people living in northern Canada, uh, Canada's warming faster than the global average. And northern Canada is warming even faster than, than the rest of Canada. Uh, so globally, um, uh, we've warmed about uh, 0 0.85 degrees, and it changes depending on your baseline. But Canada's warmed about 1.8 degrees Celsius, and this is mean uh, warming. Um, but the north is warmed 2.2 degrees Celsius. So it's uh, significantly more uh, uh, further north that you go in Canada. And we'll see that that's really important uh, in terms of some of the health impacts that uh, we're concerned about. And the world's going to keep warming. We know that. Um, this actually shows uh, two scenarios, uh, the one being the best case scenario, which is the, rep the representative classification pathway 2.6. That's if we do everything right and we reduce greenhouse gas emissions very, very quickly, uh, much more quickly than we're doing right now. Um, and if that's the case, we'd see warming of about one degree Celsius over the next century. If we stay on track to where we are, um, uh, we'll see much more significant warming. Uh, an estimate is about four degrees Celsius uh, globally um, uh, over the next uh, century, which is uh, quite, uh, quite significant. We're locked into, and this is really important from a health perspective, we're locked into another 0 0.7 degrees. Uh, it doesn't matter what we do in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So the, the, the health sector needs to prepare, needs to uh, continue preparing right now. And th these are actually uh, recent temperature projections from the Prairie Climate Change Center. And it re they really suggest, as I mentioned, we're going to continue to see this warming. This is under the, the more dramatic scenario. Uh, but you can see actually the warming uh, where you are in uh, northwestern Ontario is uh, uh, projected to be very, very significant. Uh, you know, we're looking at uh, six, seven degrees uh, mean temperature change. That's not the extremes. Um, by, uh, I think this is 20. 2051 to 2080. So that's a uh, very, very significant warming. And in terms of precipitation, um, uh, global uh, warming also affects precipitation as well. Um, and so similar projections suggest that uh, in the spring, it's going to be significantly wetter uh, in this region as well. Could see uh, an increases of, you know, 20 to 40% um, uh, increases in, in uh, wetness. Um, and so, uh, you know, concerns about uh, flooding and some of these impacts that we'll get into on health. On the other hand, in the summer, uh, you could see more dryness. So you're going to see this sort of, uh, uh, you know, much higher climate variability and greater uh, extremes. Um, and, and so again, you see slightly uh, drier conditions uh, where, where you are in the, in the future based on these uh, particular uh, projections. So, uh, you know, internationally and within Canada, health authorities are recognizing this is a very serious uh, situation uh, from a health perspective. Uh, the World Health Organization has called on health authorities to start adapting, start preparing. Um, and in fact, the American Public Health Association in 2017 called, uh, at, called the, the year 2017 uh, climate change uh, and health uh, year for, uh, for public health. Uh, so, so this is really good news that um, uh, this is being taken uh, very, very seriously. And it's very interesting to note, uh, this is a recent um, survey by the uh, Pew Research uh, Center of 42,000 adults in 38 countries, uh, and a number of uh, uh, countries see climate change as a significant concern uh, and threat to security. And uh, in Canada, um, at least uh, by this survey, it was the number one uh, threat to security. Uh, and this was done in 2017. However, um, uh, there's a lot of concern, uh, but one thing that we need to do is increase the knowledge of some of the health risks among Canadians. 
Um, this is actually an embryonic survey that uh, our office um, uh, did in 2017, and you see that uh, a lot of people can identify, uh, you know, one or two ways that climate change might impact health, but there's actually about 30% of Canadians that either don't think there's any impact uh, or um, are, are unsure of uh, what they might be. Uh, climate change and health assessments can have a really important um, education and awareness uh, benefit in terms of reaching out to stakeholders and reaching out to the public. Uh, so that's going to be really important moving forward. And this is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reports, these uh, large international reports, and uh, there's very high confidence uh, that globally a number of health impacts from climate change will increase. Um, and, and when they mean very high, or when they say very high confidence, they mean a nine out of ten chance of being uh, correct. So they're they're really confident about this. So uh, in terms of health impacts from future heat waves and forest fires, uh, reduced labor productivity, uh, which can really impact health uh, for, for a number of different reasons, uh, increased undernutrition, uh, foodborne diseases, waterborne diseases, and vector-borne diseases. And we'll talk uh, about some of these in the context of uh, of Canada. So in uh, 2014, uh, our office, uh, with our colleagues at the Public Health Agency of Canada, released a, an assessment on climate change and health. I've got a, a hard copy there, but this is all uh, online. Um, and, and there's a number of different uh, health risks that were identified uh, in that report. And you sort of see them on the uh, figure here, uh, the map of Canada. Uh, you know, things in terms of uh, waterborne diseases, uh, psychosocial impacts uh, from things like de uh, droughts and uh, floods. Uh, and a number of uh, impacts uh, in uh, in northern uh, Canada that uh, Dan will uh, speak to uh, in his uh, presentation. So for the next part of uh, the presentation, I'll, I'll get into a little bit more detail and examples of some of the things that we're concerned about uh, in Canada. So we're, uh, a number of us are aware that uh, vector-borne diseases in Canada are of concern. Um, my colleague uh, Nick Ogden in the Public Health Agency of Canada in 2008 basically predicted the northern expansion of the vector that causes Lyme disease um, through these maps uh, in 2008, and the 2014 report really validated this. And um, uh, so we're actually seeing this uh, vector come into Canada um, about 35 to 55 kilometers uh, per year. Um, and I know this is a concern in this health unit because uh, I understand you've got active surveillance of deer ticks uh, here, and you're finding some are uh, positive for this uh, for this disease. So. Uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada has updated some of these projections, and I think that's actually going to be very helpful for your assessment uh, moving forward. And, and I know you're very aware of wildfires and the impacts that wildfires can have on uh, the health of uh, Canadians. So, you know, warmer temperatures uh, from climate change and drying conditions can obviously impact uh, the number of uh, wildfires uh, moving forward. Uh, and in fact, uh, the number in Canada has doubled since the 1970s. We're seeing more uh, of these. And you'll recognize uh, a number of these uh, very severe events uh, on the slide. Uh, some of these have had really catastrophic uh, impacts. Um, you know, just in the last five or six years, we've seen very, very big uh, uh, fires that have really uh, uh, impacted uh, communities in the region. Um, and uh, importantly, the uh, IPCC uh, has indicated that wildfires are one area relative to other risks uh, that there's really significant or there could be significant limitations to how we adapt. And we may, may be seeing some of those challenges in some of the really, really bad uh, events that we've seen in California or BC or in Europe where uh, we've seen a number of people die uh, from these uh, from these events. So these are very serious uh, 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 events that are happening. And, uh, you know, certainly in this region, you've seen uh, uh, very significant wildfires. This is uh, from uh, one in 2011. Uh, that, you know, because of smoke inhalation risks and power outages and uh, impacts on uh, food, um, there were, I think, over 3,000 people, uh, First Nations, uh, eight First Nations communities uh, that had to be evacuated. So that was a, that was a, big, uh, a big event uh, from a wildfire or a number of wildfires. And we, we certainly expect these to get worse uh, uh, because of climate change. This is from uh, a report from Mike Flanagan uh, in Alberta. Uh, and he's projecting increase in frequency of these fires, the uh, uh, spatial extent and the severity uh, of them. And, and again, uh, in terms of whether or not we're talking about lightning uh, or human-induced uh, fires, um, this region is expected to see a really significant increase uh, in these events uh, uh, driven in part by uh, climate change. Again, this is just one study, 
and, and you, you know you need to uh, uh, see different studies. But certainly, um, uh, this this is uh, suggesting increased risk from these uh, events for uh, this region. And uh, you know, also aware that extreme heat uh, can really impact uh, health. Um, this is actually um, a uh, temperature mortality curves for a number of uh, cities uh, uh, in Canada, and you'll see that um, uh, you know the the real impacts on health, at least for these uh, cities, started about 26 uh, degrees Celsius or so, uh, and it can differ quite a bit uh, from uh, community to community because of things like acclimatization rates. Uh, well, the, the number of vulnerable populations that you might have, even the urban design, if you've got an urban heat island effect and, and things like that. Um, now, our office, uh, with our new programming, is really interested in looking at northern parts of Canada to see whether or not some of these health risks are uh, significant in northern parts of Canada. Uh, so that could be quite useful for, uh, for your assessment as well. And we, we also expect that um, extreme heat uh, in Canada, uh, much like it does in the U.S., kills more people uh, than many other climate-related hazards uh, and are, are going to be uh, looking at uh, improved monitoring and surveillance uh, of this. But, you know, we certainly have some um, uh, examples of events that have really taken a number of different lives in uh, B.C. And, uh, and in Quebec uh, recently. And, and certainly, uh, the danger, of course, is that um, uh, these, these uh, impacts can be very, very severe uh, when communities or health units or individuals are not prepared for them. Um, so you'll recall the uh, Russian heat wave in uh, 2010 uh, that took an estimated 55,000 uh, deaths, uh, and that was linked to peat fires, actually, smoke uh, pollution as well, that happened when uh, they had... Uh, I think it was a one in 500 year, something like that, uh, uh, event. Um, and certainly the 2003 uh, heat wave in, uh, in Europe that took, uh, uh, you know, many, many, many um, uh, deaths. So, um, you know, it's really important uh, for these, uh, you know, in terms of these climate sur uh, surprises or disasters to be prepared for them because they can be uh, very, very uh, severe. So, you know, the problem, of course, with climate change is the difficulty in sort of anticipating and planning for these uh, climate surprises. Um, and, and these assessments, climate change and health assessments, can help you uh, do that, uh, you know, increase your information uh, so that you can think about uh, these types of things. And, and just, um, you know, in terms of the future, uh, we are expecting uh, more hot days. Uh, and what you don't see here uh, is also hot nights in uh, many cities in, in Canada. And uh, hot uh, or warm nights are really important because people don't have the opportunity to cool down. Uh, and they, they need to have that uh, respite from heat so that they don't suffer uh, heat illness and such. So, um, you know, for, for some uh, cities where some of the uh, modeling has been done, you're seeing a doubling or tripling of the number of, uh, of hot days. Um, and so uh, this is going to be quite uh, significant, particularly for some of the uh, at-risk groups like uh, older adults, uh, infants and young children, people with uh, chronic uh, diseases, um, and people with uh, low socioeconomic uh, status and such. So. Uh, all of concern moving forward. And, and uh, one area that um, uh, we don't know a lot about, certainly in southern uh, Canada, I know there's been a lot of excellent research in northern Canada on food insecurity and climate change. Um, uh, but certainly in, in southern Canada, uh, uh, we, we need to learn more about this. Um, a colleague uh, in the uh, Climate Change and Innovation Bureau, where I work at uh, Health Canada, has actually developed a, a framework for, for understanding what some of the impacts could be uh, in terms of uh, impacts on you know, food production, processing, distribution, and preparation and consumption. And you know, it's a very, very complex area, but uh, uh, the outcomes uh, could be very, very uh, severe uh, if you're seeing uh, greater levels of food insecurity uh, for, for uh, populations. So, so we're, uh, you know, hoping that this uh, helps uh, moving forward in terms of understanding this area. And one last area that I'll highlight before getting into uh, some of the other aspects of the presentation is, that, and it's a new area as well, uh, the mental health impacts of climate change. I think there's increased uh, concern among uh, public health officials uh, across Canada in terms of what some of these indirect and longer lasting effects can be. So uh, these are some of the um, uh, things that uh, we're seeing uh, uh, after the Manitoba flood, very severe flood in that province in 2011, um, uh, there were uh, increases in alcohol and drug uh, use, increases in family violence, depression, anxiety, and uh, sleep disruption. And uh, you know, a number of people were evacuated for a very, very long time, um, which I think contributed uh, to some of those uh, health outcomes. 
so again, a growing area of, uh, of interest, uh, uh, certainly for our office and partners, I think. And, and I think we do need to remember as well that climate change uh, can and does have impacts on health services. And you know, health services and social services are really the, first, the front line of defense uh, with, uh, with these events. Uh, this is a, um, um, a map uh, by colleagues in the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare. Um, they've actually developed a tool for health facilities to use to see whether or not they're resilient to climate change. It's basically a checklist that could be of interest. But they've developed a map just highlighting uh, where we've seen impacts on health facilities in Canada from uh, floods, uh, from extreme heat, uh, hurricanes, uh, wildfires and such. Um, just to, to reiterate that uh, we need to be thinking about uh, some of these critical infrastructures uh, as much as uh, you know, individual impacts on, on Canadians. So um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to uh, help uh, Canadians uh, increase their resilience, to help um, uh, uh, communities and health systems uh, to prepare for climate change. And, uh, and I think the foundation uh, of this is, is conducting these studies to see you know, what are the vulnerabilities out there, what are the risks. And uh, what do we need to, to address in the short term and perhaps what, uh, what, what do we need to do in the longer term? So th this figure here is actually, it's a, it's a really great uh, report. This is the uh, operational framework for building climate resilient health systems uh, released by the World Health Organization in 2015. And it really helps uh, conceptualize the different parts of the health system uh, that they would argue need to be addressed to, to prepare for climate change. Um, and so there's, you know, different components on the, the inner ring and the outer ring in terms of service delivery and health information systems, essential medical products and technologies, uh, a range of different things. But I just want to highlight that uh, vulnerability uh, um, capacity and, you know, uh, adaptation assessments are a key part of um, uh, what they suggest uh, need to be done. And, and these, these assessments are, are so useful because they can help you um, identify, well, who exactly uh, do we expect would be affected? Um, you know, what uh, are the specific climate change uh, hazards uh, which are going to uh, impact health or that we need to be concerned about in our jurisdiction? Uh, when will health be impacted? Are there things that we're seeing right now that we need to be concerned about or are these things that, uh, you know, are going to come in, in a few decades? Um, and where will uh, health risks uh, be the greatest? Um, so this is really uh, obviously important uh, when you have limited resources and you have other uh, issues that uh, are really, really important, uh, which I know you do, um, to have this information to be able to direct some of your uh, activities moving forward. And, and I think uh, I, I mentioned before, you know, assessments can help us think about uh, some sort of these climate surprises uh, that can result in, um, you know, quite severe impacts in uh, communities. And this is really interesting from... Uh, um, an expert, uh, uh, Dr. Chris Ebay, um, uh, international expert on climate change and health. And, uh, the argument is that a lot of the research uh, right now on impacts uh, really assumes a sort of linear uh, increase in impact. And also uh, in terms of how we will adapt to those, a sort of linear increase in, in adaptation. And that may not actually be the case, right? We might actually start seeing impacts that uh, uh, are sort of nonlinear or, or really jump uh, in terms of their response to uh, the climate system. Um, and so as you know, health authorities, we need to be uh, prepared for that. And I, you know, I thought this was an interesting uh, and kind of a scary example uh, in uh, September uh, when for the first time there were three uh, uh, large hurricanes in um, the Gulf of Mexico that had the potential to uh, hit land. And in fact, as we know, um, you know, there were a number of hurricanes that did a lot of damage uh, in that area. So, um, you know, the, I think, uh, again, assessments can get you thinking about uh, uh, what, uh, what are the kinds of risks that uh, are really important uh, for your jurisdiction. Um, and, you know, in terms of complex uh, emergencies, um, an example, I think, in, uh, in Canada would be, um, you know, the Slave Lake uh, wildfires that were um, very uh, significant, uh, 400 structures were burnt down um, in May 2011. Uh, but importantly, uh, that was followed by two floods um, within weeks uh, after that wildfire. Uh, and so climate change increases the probability that we're gonna see these types of cascading events. Um, and so how does one uh, think about uh, preparing for that or building the resilience in the community and, and among uh, people um, so that um, you're better prepared uh, for these types of uh, things if they should occur. 
So again, um, these assessments can provide the evidence base for taking preventative actions uh, to protect health from climate change impacts. But you know, what do we mean by adaptation um, uh, in terms of uh, health uh, or public health actions? So this is an example that uh, I've developed. It's more from the health emergency uh, management uh, uh, kind of side of things. And so you'll be familiar with uh, a number of these different uh, emergency management actions in terms of conducting hazard and risk vulnerability assessments. Uh, some communities do this, or provinces do this regularly. Um, you know, disaster mitigation, uh, uh, general disaster planning, maybe tabletop exercises and surveillance and such. There are opportunities uh, when uh, these uh, actions are undertaken to integrate climate change information and consideration into these. Um, so, for example, um, you know, uh, and for disaster mitigation, um, thinking about how you can prevent uh, some of these uh, exposures in your community by redesigning your community, perhaps. Uh, our office does a lot of work in terms of the urban heat island. Uh, how do you design um, uh, communities in big cities in a different way with green canopy to reduce the heat um, from affecting uh, populations? Um, you know, disaster planning, well, thinking about some of these uh, simultaneous or cascading events that might occur and how would you uh, prepare for these. Um, uh, tabletop exercises, in the past we've helped uh, a few communities with uh, extreme heat and health uh, undertake tabletop exercises uh, to see whether or not they're prepared for heat uh, waves and things like that. Well, can you actually integrate a climate change scenario uh, into those types of um, uh, exercises? Uh, surveillance, monitoring new health risks uh, that uh, might be climate related. Um, and uh, even, uh, you know, increasing planning capacity, uh, having partners with climate change uh, knowledge and staff aware of climate change risks. So there are opportunities uh, to, you know, start integrating climate change into these types of uh, activities, and assessments really help you uh, do that with uh, evidence-based information. So um, we, we've got uh, a, a number of excellent uh, guidance uh, and, and tools for conducting uh, assessments. Um, and, and this is actually uh, the World Health Organization um, a guidance document. Uh, it was uh, released in 2012, and we helped uh, develop that, uh, uh, that document. Um, and it uh, really, you know, in, in, a, in the broad way, uh, discusses framing and scoping assessments, uh, assessing vulnerability uh, within communities, and then uh, managing and monitoring uh, risk. Um, and, and this is actually an updated document from a 2003 report that they had uh, where they included a number of uh, different case studies. So this has been very helpful in the Canadian context as kind of a foundational piece for, for undertaking these assessments. Well, um, uh, as uh, Aaron, you mentioned, uh, this the Ministry of Health, uh, Health and Long-Term Care, um, based on the WHO guidelines, uh, has actually released a full climate change and health toolkit, which is a really great um, uh, report um, and you know it has these three different um, uh, uh, I guess components. Uh, one is the full assessment uh, guidance in terms of how you go through the, the different steps. Uh, but something that uh, is quite new, I think even internationally, is it uh, has this workbook um, that provides templates uh, for um, uh, addressing. And I think we're on to a good example of this. Um, that you can actually go through for the different uh, steps of doing an assessment um, in a, a group setting um, or with, uh, you know, with a small core team um, to identify, in this case, uh, who would be on your uh, project team um, to undertake uh, some of the work. Um, another example is um, a template that uh, provides some examples of what are the types of uh, vulnerability indicators that you might be looking at uh, through your assessment. And so you'll see that, uh, well, this one is just related to extreme heat events, um, but looking at, uh, you know, what are some of the exposures uh, that we're concerned about in a community or a region with respect to extreme heat? Um, so the, uh, you know, uh, proportion of uh, people living um, in, in very high areas in, um, uh, or in, uh, you know, maybe without air conditioning. Uh, sensitivity in terms of the types of populations that you might be uh, concerned about, and the adaptive capacity um, uh, in sort of health and social services, or whether or not there's a heat alert response uh, system uh, in that uh, particular community. Um, so these templates can be used, uh, again, with uh, partners and stakeholders to go through identifying what types of uh, uh, health concerns that uh, you'll focus on during the, uh, during the assessment. 
So, you know, in terms of moving forward with the, uh, the assessment in this uh, health unit, um, our office uh, uh, can and is providing um, uh, expert advice and support, and it's really in these uh, key areas that we're doing uh, so. so um, uh, some advice in terms of engaging stakeholders based on uh, other uh, projects that uh, we've been involved in. Uh, importantly, how to communicate uh, assessment results uh, to decision makers to really be able to inform that adaptation. Um, what are some of the sources of climate and uh, weather data? And I'll talk a tiny bit more about that. Um, that can complement the data that you'll have in your uh, health unit. Um, what are some of the uh, best or good practices for mapping climate and weather data within the, the assessment? Um, and this is a really important one. How do you analyze the results? Um, so when you look at uh, possible climate change impacts on uh, food safety uh, or on heat, uh, extreme heat illness uh, or on um, uh, vector-borne diseases, and you have different uh, types of information in terms of exposures and projections and sensitive. How do you compare these uh, different uh, the different results? Um, that can be a real challenge um, because you'll have different gaps in different places. Um, and so, um, you know, we've uh, had some experience with uh, partners in terms of what can uh, work in terms of that uh, type of analysis, but that, it can be a bit of a challenge. And, uh, you know, the, the great thing is that there's a number of uh, assessments that have been done from local to national scales uh, that they've either been done or are actually incur occurring. Um, so I mentioned uh, the national scale, uh, the 2014 report. That was actually an update to a, a, a full comprehensive uh, report in 2008. Um, but there have been a number of subnational uh, assessments, um, uh, Peel Region, uh, Surrey, BC, and Middlesex, London. And just recently, uh, Simcoe Muskoka released, and I think you might be aware of this, uh, a full climate change and health uh, vulnerability assessment report, uh, and others, including yours, are, are ongoing. So there's a real uh, opportunity and a really important uh, opportunity to learn from others uh, in terms of uh, undertaking these types of uh, projects. Um, and our office is actually um, looking at developing a bit of a network or community of practice among uh, health authorities um, to connect people in terms of uh, you know, what, uh, what works uh, when doing a particular step and how do you address certain challenges that you might find. Uh, this would be modeled on um, the US CDC. Uh, they've got a full program on conducting um, these assessments uh, and in fact have different uh, communities of practice around that and I think they've found it very, very useful. Um, so we're looking forward to that. So just uh, by way of, uh, of example, this is a Middlesex London um, assessment and uh, Really what, uh, what they did um, was, uh, you know, th three or four key steps in terms of, um, uh, you know, doing a literature review on sort of current uh, risk to health from these climate-related uh, hazards. Um, and in fact, looking at what are some of the current programs in place. Uh, so for example, here you've got the active surveillance for Lyme, uh, you know, Lyme disease. Um, they also uh, pulled from some of the uh, results in terms of the modeled future risk. Uh, with climate change, so we understand uh, what the current situation might be in terms of the number of peat illnesses or deaths, what are, what are we looking uh, forward to in the future, um, and then in terms of engaging stakeholders uh, and getting their input on some of the preliminary results, um, and, uh, uh, but also engaging them in terms of what's the capacity of the community um, to uh, deal with some of the, the possible impacts in the future um, and to sort of build that awareness. Uh, among people about what uh, what might need to be done. So they had uh, a number of uh, key recommendations uh, coming out of that um, uh, report. Um, so, you know, increasing the understanding of urban and rural vulnerabilities because it came out that there's uh, can be significant differences uh, between these types of communities um, and, and that was an important area to understand more uh, in the future. Um, you know, areas that perhaps uh, might need to enhance surveillance and monitoring um, uh, maybe a bit better evaluation of existing adaptation uh, programs because uh, a lot of these uh, they, they knew are going to be stressed uh, perhaps even more with the climate change impacts. Um, because that, that's a really key uh, point uh, that current impacts from climate change could actually be making a lot of your programs less effective than they otherwise could be. And if you don't do this type of an assessment, you may not even know that. Uh, and that, that uh, um, that could be the case for Health Canada as well, the, some, of, some of our programs. So that, that's important to find that out. Um, and, you know, how do you um, uh, educate public officials and, uh, and the public about growing risks? Uh, that was uh, indicated as the next step. 
um, and then perhaps even developing a climate change and health adaptation plan moving forward. So these are the kinds of things that can come out uh, in terms of uh, recommendations from the type of study that you've uh, embarked on. And just one more example, uh, Peel Region uh, also conducted uh, a comprehensive climate change and health uh, assessment. And they're now actually, uh, or they have used the uh, results to inform the development of an urgent response plan and a risk communication strategy for environmental hazards. And they're actually thinking about updating uh, their assessment based on the current uh, census uh, numbers that have uh, come out, because I think they found it very useful for these types of uh, purposes, which, which, is, uh, which is great. So um, just a, a few uh, last slides in terms of what Health Canada and partners are doing uh, to help uh, protect uh, Canadians from climate change uh, uh, impacts. Um, you'll be familiar, uh, hopefully, with the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, and this is a key document for the, um, uh, for the uh, federal and provincial and territorial governments moving forward uh, in terms of climate change. And there's a, a key area on protecting and improving human health and uh, well-being uh, that focuses on addressing climate change-related health risks um, and also supporting healthy Indigenous uh, communities. Um, so uh, areas of focus include extreme heat events, uh, infectious diseases, and importantly, adaptation investments on surveillance and monitoring, risk assessments, uh, modeling, uh, laboratory diagnostics, and, and such. Um, so this is really great uh, uh, to be able to move forward uh, with new funding in a number of these uh, different areas. And in terms of our office, uh, there are three key areas uh, uh, moving forward. Um, one is we're going to continue um, uh, expanding heat alert and response systems to communities that need that uh, in Canada based on uh, work that we've been doing in the last uh, seven or eight years. Um, and, uh, and also uh, doing more monitoring and surveillance of climate change impacts on health to fill some of those knowledge gaps. Uh, for example, um, you know, what are the mental health impacts of uh, floods uh, or wildfires? Um, uh, you know, in, in uh, Fort McMurray, there were some reports that uh, 20,000 people um, had to seek uh, mental health assistance after that uh, fire. Uh, so some of these can be very significant impacts. We need better data uh, on that. And then this is a third area that um, uh, moving forward uh, we'll be looking at, uh, and it's the climate change and health adaptation capacity uh, building contribution program. Uh, we really uh, terribly need to shorten that title, um, very, very long title. Um, but, but really to, uh, the purpose is going to be to support local and regional health authorities in really understanding better uh, the impacts of climate change on health um, and, and then uh, being able to take those uh, adaptation actions. So we'll be providing more information on the specifics of the program, hopefully in the next month or so, uh, but there will be uh, funding available uh, uh, for that. So that's uh, certainly exciting uh, for me uh, being in the office for a long, long time um, uh, moving forward. And then um, just to, for, for anybody that's not aware, um, we've actually uh, launched the next uh, National Climate Change and Health uh, Technical Assessment Report that will be released in 2021, uh, if we're on time, and hopefully we, we will be. It's going to be part of a broader series of reports that are led by Natural Resources Canada, um, but this is going to be a full um, uh, assessment uh, report, um, basically an update to the 2008 uh, comprehensive uh, report. And so we're really uh, quite excited about that. Um, uh, there's, there's actually Natural Resources Canada has a full website uh, on the, um, uh, the suite of reports that are going to be uh, uh, provided um, and, uh, and, and inviting the public uh, to provide comments on what they'd like to see uh, and partners uh, out of these reports. I think importantly for your assessment in 2018, not that far from now, Environment Canada will be releasing the first of this suite of reports that really has updated information on some of these climate changes, the precipitation and the heat. And there may be that opportunity for you to benefit from, uh, depending on the timing, uh, some of that new information, uh, which is obviously drives uh, some of the uh, health impacts. Um, so I'd be happy to provide uh, more information uh, on this. I, I think it's a great opportunity uh, to kind of benefit uh, from the different assessment pieces moving forward and to be able to feed into uh, to each. So, uh, so I'm looking forward to that. So just to uh, end, uh, we do have um, uh, certainly on extreme heat and health a lot of information that uh, uh, we can provide uh, to you if uh, that's of interest. 
Um, but I, I really uh, do look forward to uh, continuing the partnership in terms of um, your assessment um, and uh, and learning from it. And I uh, just want to thank you again for that uh, for that opportunity.